All right. So given that we have, it looks like we already have a decent crowd and it sounded like we need every minute we have. Let's let's get started right on time. So welcome everyone to this latest installment of the MP seminar series. My name is Janos and I'm your host for today's seminar. For anyone who's new to this series, um, hold on, a couple of questions coming up here. Sorry, for anyone new to the series, we welcome presentations from both eminent researchers and early career scientists. And if you know someone you would like to nominate as a future speaker, that can be yourself as well. You can visit materialsproject.org slash seminars, where we have a speaker suggestion form. We will be recording this talk and it will be posted to the MP YouTube channel in the next couple of days. If you have questions, please just raise your hand during the talk. Uh, assuming, by the way, Tian, is that fine with you, uh, intermediate questions, or would you prefer yep. them at the end? Yep, that works for me, uh, for short questions uh, in the, during the talk. Okay, yeah, so for short clarifying questions, just raise your hand anytime, and uh, you can also use the Q&A button in the Zoom toolbar to submit them, and then we will definitely also have a question and answer session at the very end. Um, Tian already mentioned that it will be a, a, an in-depth presentation, so it's best if you brought a few extra minutes for questions at the end. It's quite possible that we'll run a few minutes over. Uh, and so with that said, let me go straight to introducing today's speaker. Today we have Tian Xie. Tian leads the Microsoft AI for Science team working on generative modeling of inorganic materials, which I believe is spread across Microsoft's Cambridge UK and, and Redmond US offices. Um, before joining Microsoft in 2022, Tian was a postdoc at MIT, and before that he did a PhD in material science and engineering also at MIT, advised by Jeffrey Grossman. And in this seminar, Tian will present his most recent paper, which introduces a new generative model for arbitrary periodic materials called MatterGen. And in this paper, uh, they demonstrate that MatterGen both increases the success rate of proposing new stable crystals while also being able to adhere more closely to user-defined property constraints. Um, and these can differ wildly from the, from the modes of those properties in the model's training data, which is a very compelling feature and which I'm sure we'll hear more about in this talk. So with that, let me stop sharing my screen and hand the stage over to Tian. Jen, please take it away. Thank you very much, Janusz. Uh, first, uh, for your invitation and also for like great introduction. So I, I would uh, have to maybe make a little few clarification. First, is that I'm leading the materials team at Air Force Science. Uh, so I'm not leading the entire Air Force Science effort, of course. Uh, so and also uh, we have actually so we are pretty global team. We have teams in the UK, Cambridge, uh, Amsterdam in Netherlands, uh, Berlin in Germany, and also Beijing and Shanghai in China, and uh, Redmond uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the Washington state in the US. So yeah, that's kind of a brief overview about uh, uh, Microsoft Research AI for Science, we, where we're committed in using AI to solve some of the biggest challenges. Uh, in the world. So uh, okay, so that's uh, that's enough intro about uh, um, the organization that I'm currently in. Uh, so it is a great honor for me to be here to be presenting our work management at this very, I would say, pre this prestigious uh, materials uh, seminar series. Okay. Uh, so most of the things I'm going to talk about today will be uh, available. You can see that in more detail in this preprint that we have posted around a month ago. Okay, so now let me get started. So uh, so first, uh, uh, so I wanted to highlight that the manager is really the result of the highly collaborative teamwork that we have at AI for Science. The core team are the seven people uh, that was listed at the top uh, uh, top. And also we have a major, like a lot of contributions from of our interns and many other researchers at AI for Science. So I would just want to say uh, this work is really not possible without the, the contribution of everybody. And it's such a great pleasure to work with all of them uh, in the past year. 
so for this audience, probably I don't need to explain why materials are important. They're really the cornerstone of modern technology. And many of the problems we are facing today, they're really bottlenecked, right, by finding new materials. For example, if we can find a battery material with a much higher energy density, uh, uh, the electric car, our electric cars could be running much longer. If we can find the one carbon capture material that can absorb carbon CO2 very well, it could uh, lead, uh, it could become a key component of this carbon capture industry that uh, many expected to be on the order of like a trillion dollar uh, uh, revenue in the coming uh, decade. So, uh, so, so the central question, right, in materials design is really about finding a material whose properties that satisfy the design requirements for the application. So in here, I'm steering one slide from Professor Xu Ping On, where he listed some of the design requirements that was needed, right, for finding a good solid state electrolyte material for the lithium ion batteries. So, so in, in general speaking, right, we have simulation workflows for each one of these design requirements where the key challenge is really to find a material whose property satisfies all these uh, property constraints. Uh, so one, uh, one more very popular approach that has made a major impact in the past decade is to discover new material with this large scale computational screening uh, methods. Uh, so, uh, so you start with a uh, 10K or 100K materials you run these uh, computational workflows, right, to gradually filter down the candidates uh, via the screening funnels. And at the end, you have maybe 10, uh, five to 10 materials that are most promising, uh, which, which you are sent into experimental lab to synthesize and measure their properties. And then if you find that maybe one or two material that is really good, say battery material, right, then you try to scale that up and build into real, real batteries that lead into a commercialization of these new materials. So in the past few years, we have seen major progress in using AI to accelerate this, pro uh, accelerate this process. So I think many of you have heard about this genome work uh, from, from Google DeepMind, where they developed an active learning strategy to iteratively discover uh, more materials uh, using by training a machine learning force field combined with substitution methods, where uh, via several iterations, uh, they were able to discover 2.2 million uh, novel and stable materials, and among which uh, 400,000 uh, of them are on the canvas hub. So this, what it does is it really expands the initial candidate space, right, uh, by one order of magnitude from, uh, from like a, a 10 to the order of 5 to 10 to the order of 6. Uh, for many of the applications. So in addition, uh, another important line of research is really to use, uh, uh, to, use a, uh, uh, to, to accelerate this, uh, the simulator for the screening process, where we have seen this general force fields, right? So uh, similar to like MCGNet, which have enabled a thousand times faster simulation for a lot of the simulation workflows. So here's a one reason of work that's coming from our colleagues at, at Microsoft Azure Quantum team, uh, where uh, they, they used um, uh, MCGNet to basically screen a lot of uh, uh, solid state electrolyte material, and they went all the way to the lab and find this uh, one material that have that have a seventy percent less lithium than normal material that can be uh, 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 that was experimentally discovered uh, for uh, in, in in by collaboration with uh, PNNL uh, in in the lab. So uh, so with all these major advances, right? So in 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 computation in screening based material discovery, uh, we think it's pretty clear that one of the next frontier is really generative based materials design. So we're with the state of art, right? Screening based methods, and we now can access in order of a 10 to the order of five to 10 to the order of six order of materials, right? But if you really want to access this largest, much larger space of, of potential materials, so you have to use generative models. So this enables us to break through this another five to six of a magnitude, order of a magnitude of a larger material space. So this is why we developed the Metagen, which is uh, one of the first uh, uh, generative model for inorganic materials that was enable uh, property-based uh, uh, materials design, which I'm going to explain in more detail uh, for the rest of my, uh, my talk. 
So the outline of today's talk is going to be following. Uh, so because I know maybe some of the audience maybe are coming from more like a machine learning domain. So I'm going to start by talking about what are materials. And then I'm going to go into details regarding the our diffusion model for materials. And then I'm going to talk about how you train this model and generate the novel stable materials. Then I'm going to talk about the conditional generation. Finally, I'm going to talk about how you can apply this model to some more realistic materials design problems. OK, so now let's get started. Uh, so in here, when we talk about the materials, we're actually only talking about a specific type of a material called crystalline materials or inorganic materials. Uh, so, 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 uh, so here, I'm showing you one example of lithium copper oxide, uh, which is basically a material, uh, the discovery of which won the Nobel Prize. Uh, because it's a it's a such important component for today's lithium-ion battery technology. Uh, in the real form, it can it can look like a, as a powder or like a crystal, but in the atomic scale, it is a periodic arrangement of atoms uh, in the three-dimensional space. So in here, I wanted to kind of highlight that. Uh, so in here, this atom can be made up with all the elements in a periodic table. This is a quite different from other atomic systems like small molecules or proteins, where most elements are coming from, say, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So mathematically, in order to describe material, uh, you need usually to represent them using its smallest the repeating unit, which we call unit cell, because it is a periodic structure, right? So to fully describe this mathematically, you need to describe uh, the atom types and the coordinates of n atoms. And also you need to describe a lattice, uh, which is a list of three vectors, L1, L2, L3, uh, which describes the periodicity of the system along three dimensions in the, in the, in the three-dimensional space. So you can imagine that you can kind of take this unit cell, repeating unit, and uh, like translate that was according to all the integer combinations of this uh, L2, L1, L2, three vectors. And then you can tile the entire three dimensional space to form the periodic structure. So I just want to note here that in here we represent the atom coordinates with its fractional coordinate, uh, which is a number between zero and one and using this L1, L2, L3 as the basis. And so if you want to convert that into the Cartesian coordinates, then you need to do a, a, a dot product a matrix of multiplication to this L vector here. Uh, so in, uh, after I, I have described the definition about the materials, it is important to understand uh, what we mean by the stability of the materials, right? So, 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 so basically in here, uh, I'm uh, so you can imagine assuming that you have two elements, right, A and B, and according to the previous mathematical definition, right? So you can kind of arrange these two atoms in infinitely different ways, right? Uh, in, to form a periodic structure. And obviously not all of them are stable, right? So each one of them will have its energy. So therefore, but, uh, but uh, so, so if you know this energy, then we can help you to understand which ones are stable using this so-called compositional phase diagram. Here, I'm plotting all the other materials for A and B uh, in this xy plot, where the x-axis is the, the ratio of A in A and B, and the y-axis is their formation energy. So you can, it is known that the materials are stable if they are on the lowest uh, convex hull of this uh, plot, basically the gray dots here. And basically all the points, all the, all the structures that are above this hull, like the blue dots here, they will decompose into materials that is on the, on the compass hull. Uh, so uh, this basically gives you a sense, right? Which, how do you know if a, a material is stable? And it's also important to introduce this concept of energy above the hull, which is basically the distance of the, a material uh, uh, for its energy with respect to the compass hull. So generally speaking, we think a material is stable if they're exactly on the hull, but they can also be metastable if they are within the 0 0.1 EV per atom of the hull. Uh, so they can still have the chance to be synthesized. For example, diamond is one example that is a, a, around the 0 0.14 EV above the compass hull. So after, no, after learning the definition of the material as well as the definition of stability, it is we can actually formulate 
the learning objective, right, of our genetic model. So in here, our goal is to be able to learn a genetic model that was able to generate all possible uh, metastable materials that can form the periodic structure in the three-dimensional space. So in here, we define metastable as within 0.1 EV per atom. Obviously, uh, this can be defined better, but this is what we do within the scope of this work. So, and, uh, so because actually in here, we are building a genetic model material, right? But uh, we are actually, uh, so we actually rest in the regime of low data regime, right? We're talking about maybe uh, 100,000 or a million data points, right? Not in the language model space. So it's very important that we can build in an inductive bias, right? Into the model. For example, we hope that the generation process can be symmetry, can respect the equivalent uh, equivalence of the materials. We hope to capture symmetry, uh, periodicity. We hope to be able to add different conditions. And these are some of the constraints that we hope into building into our model. So now I'm going to the next section. Um, maybe I'm seeing you a few, uh, a few questions uh, coming in the slide deck. I wonder maybe if people can shout out for maybe one quick question. Uh, if they want to ask now, maybe it's a good time. Otherwise, I'll, I'll just move on. Yeah, I think, oh, there's actually a question from, um, let me see if I can unmute that person. Uh, I think you're unmuted, so you, you can ask your question now, or you can write in the chat. Uh, hi, uh, I wanted to know that how you extend the, your search domain to alloys because uh, AB3 is, or AB2, there are uh, actually uh, simple uh, systems, but what if you have an alloy? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So basically, if you have an alloy, right, you will actually have a lot of stretches that have very similar energy, right, that is kind of uh, also uh, close to the convex. So right now, we just uh, put all different configurations of alloy into our training data, but uh, basically, but we are the, the training data is certainly not exhaustive for all different configurations. So therefore, uh, this is actually one of our future step. We hope to make the model work better for alloys, but for, for, so uh, for now, we just include uh, any alloy structure that we have in our training data and uh, use that to train our model. So will you use uh, uh, random alloys uh, models to generate uh, the model the models, or uh, you are you will uh, consider all uh, actually possible configurations? Uh, only using uh, using uh, alloy structures that uh, were uh, very uh, in popular. We will not exhaustive research. It's only what we have in the training data. What we have in materials project, basically. Yes. Uh, and the last question is how we, you will bring uh, thermal uh, stability to the uh, to, to the play because uh, I think uh, for this uh, uh, slides you just focused on uh, actually ground state structures and uh, they, they, I didn't see any temperature dependency uh, in your uh, slides. Uh, yes, we don't have any temperature dependency right now. So uh, currently uh, we incorporate uh, a thermal as uh, basically the final filtering stage. Uh, so the, 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 the generative model only considers uh, they're okay, but uh, we can incorporate, uh, for example, we generated 10 materials that we can run some simulation to identify their thermal stability and uh, filter out those candidates that were not stable. Yeah. All right, thanks for answering that. I think we can move on. Okay, yeah, let's move on because I think we have a limited amount of time. So now let me go into the more details right, regarding our diffusion model. So I think uh, for those of you who are not familiar with diffusion models, diffusion model is one of the uh, one of the latest in the state of art class of genetic model uh, for uh, in, that was developing machine learning, showing state of art generation performance for images, proteins, etc. So I'm not going into details today, but uh, if you want to learn more about diffusion models. I'm giving you some links about some really nice tutorials for diffusion models. So at a higher level, right? So the diffusion model, uh, in diffusion models, uh, you kind of, uh, for, for the data modality you have, you kind of uh, design a fixed corruption, forward corruption process in which you, you gradually add noise, like Gaussian noise, 
into into your data, and uh, you gradually uh, you iteratively corrupt your 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 data uh, such that at the limit you approach some kind of a limiting distribution, uh, which is a fix that you can sample from. Uh, at the same time, right, you would learn a reverse model, which is a which is a, a more like most data a neural network to kind of a reverse this corruption process. So therefore, uh, during the generation process, you just kind of a sample from this limiting distribution, and then you kind of iteratively apply your neural network to generating uh, the data that you have. So basically in Metagen, right, we just build a diffusion model uh, for materials in the space of this like atom type position and lattice. So we design a forward process to corrupt atom type of positions so that we reach a limiting distribution of random atom and random structures. And at the same time, we learn a reverse model that, learn, that reverses process so that in the sampling, uh, during the generation process, we just sample from this random distribution of, uh, of materials. So, so, so first I'm going to talk about how do we design this forward uh, corruption process. Uh, so so, so, yeah, so you, uh, to understand the, the first step to understand the forward corruption process, it is important to understand that actually in here, we kind of factorize this uh, uh, corruption of atom type uh, and positions into three independent uh, corruption process for atom types, positions, and uh, letters. Uh, so it is important to note that even though the forward process uh, we assume this uh, independence right between these three different attributes. So the reverse model is still a joint model, meaning we still take in both atom type positions and train the reverse model uh, jointly. So in the next few slides, I'm going to talk into a little bit more detail for each one of this corruption process. So first, I'm going to talk about atom corruption, where we take this uh, method called a D3PM. This is because atom type is a categorical variable, right? So you can only take values from the 100 elements in the periodic table. So we, we use this method called DCPM, which was specifically designed for uh, discrete variables. And at the highest level, this idea, so they introduce a, this uh, a Markov transition matrix Q, uh, which uh, basically corrupts uh, this random variable of atom types. So there are many different ways one could design this Markov transition matrix, uh, which are illustrated in, in the paper. But uh, empirically, we found this the Marx uh, categorical diffusion process performs the best. So in here, this transition matrix was basically you are kind of corrupting these uh, atom types into a master state with certain probability beta at each state, each step. So that uh, basically at the limiting diffusion, right? So everything becomes this master state. And then in the reverse process, you're kind of generating all different elements from this master state. So it is, uh, so the next let's go into talking about how do we build uh, the diffusion corruption process for fractional coordinates. So in here, the most important thing is to realizing that the coordinates are living in the periodic space, right? So if you kind of move an atom within the unit cell, moving from moving out of the box from one direction, it will kind of coming back, right, from the other direction, right? So the key question is how do you actually capture this periodicity in the forward corruption process? So in here we got inspired from this regional work of torsional diffusion uh, for molecular conformal generation, where they design a corruption process for this uh, torsional angles right, within the molecule. So this is a value that you can take between minus pi and pi. It actually have a very similar property as what we have. It also has a periodicity, right? If you move these torsional angles out, uh, uh, outside of a pi, they were kind of coming back from minus pi. So uh, in this paper, they show that you can actually describe the corruption process for these periodic uh, uh, variables using something called a wrapped normal distribution, which is basically a summation of a Gaussian distributions of a bunch of Gaussian modes that each, each centered around 0, 2 pi, uh, 4 pi, and minus 2 pi. If you sum all this up, then uh, gradually increase the variance of this Gaussian distribution, then you can show that the limiting distribution will basically be a uniform distribution within minus pi and pi. 
So this is a very uh, nice uh, as a result to be able to uh, capture this periodicity in the forward corruption process. So what we did is that we just take this idea, but extend this from one dimension to three dimension. Basically, you can, you can, you can represent the corruption of fractional coordinates uh, within a 3D uh, raptor normal distribution. And one additional thing we actually did was that we actually rescaled this variance, this sigma, using the number of atoms. This is because we are now building diffusion in the fractional coordinates, right? So therefore, we hope to kind of uh, rescale this variance such that uh, the corruption you add in the Cartesian space uh, is similar, uh, no matter for bigger crystals with more atoms or smaller crystals with fewer atoms. So the last thing we, uh, we introduced is this lattice diffusion, which is basically how you can corrupt these three lattice vectors, so L2, L1, L2, and L3. So in here, the most important thing here was that uh, you, we want to kind of, uh, uh, so there are actually an additional degree of freedom here, which is a rotational degree of freedom, meaning you can apply a rotation matrix right, to these uh, three lattice vectors. You can rotate it together with the coordinates, and the, the material will actually not change. So actually, we want to get rid of this rotation matrix. So what do we want? What we did is that we did this, uh, we used this approach called a polar decomposition, where we kind of decompose this lattice well into a rotation matrix and a symmetric matrix, and we only perform diffusion over this symmetric matrix. And uh, let me get into a little bit more details, right, for this ladder diffusion. Uh, so, which is basically additional thing we introduced to perform custom lean and variance to make the model perform better. So let me explain what does that mean. So if actually, if you do the kind of the naive, uh, the variance preserving diffusion for the lattice, right? So basically you are, so your limiting distribution for the lattice will basically be centered around zero. You're basically gonna sample a lot of a small uh, lattice vectors, uh, at least in some of the dimensions. This will actually lead into highly skilled limiting lattice. So this is causing a lot of problems because if you have very, very skilled limiting lattice, then you're, you're having a very strange crystal structure where causing a lot of a training instability. So what we performed is that we kind of adjust this uh, mean and variance such that, uh, so at the limit, we actually approach more like a cubic lattice. And the size of a cube is also scaled by the number of atoms. So this actually significantly improved our training instability and making our model perform much better. Uh, so this is a kind of a, an overview, right, about how do we kind of a corrupt the crystal structure in the forward process by independently corrupt atom types positions in the lattice. So now let me introduce how do we learn this reverse model that kind of reverse this corrupt structure back into the stable crystal structure. So in here, uh, we uh, the reverse model is a equivalent uh, a GN, a square network. Actually, it is a GMNET. We take the GMNET architecture, if you are familiar with that. And this model inputs a corrupted crystal structure and outputs uh, three scores for atom types, uh, positions, and the letters, right? For atom type, it's an invariant score. For the, for the lattice and the coordinates, these are equivalent scores. So, and uh, there's a, a couple of technical issues that we need to handle. First is how would you handle periodicity? And then the second, right? Uh, so is how to ha handle the equivalent score for the lattice because uh, uh, it has already been solved into handle how to equivalent the score for the coordinates in the, in the gym net. So for handling periodicity, uh, we use this multi-graph representation uh, for periodic structures, uh, which we introduced in, in the CGCN work, which I think many of this audience would be uh, familiar with. But uh, let me kind of get in, spend a little bit of time for getting into details here. So if you want to uh, represent a material structure, right, a, a periodic material structure using graph, so it is important to introduce multiple edges to represent this graph. So here's an example of a, a material with two atoms. Uh, uh, cesium uh, chloride. Uh, so even though there are only two atoms in the periodic cell, if you're looking at the center atoms and looking at its neighbors, there are actually eight neighbors that have the same distance. Uh, and uh, all the other neighbors are the periodic image of the original 
uh, atom. Uh, so therefore, if you uh, represent this in a graph, uh, you're going to be needed to introduce a edge label, uh, K, which basically describes how would you translate this atom J in order to achieve this label. Uh, but uh, basically, once you have this multigraph representation of the material, right, so that it's becoming easy to compute this edge vector, uh, D, I, J, and K, which is basically the vector between uh, atom I and J plus this translation vector, and then perform a docked product with respect to L. And then you can basically adapt this for any uh, equivalent gene architecture just by replacing this edge vector dij with this periodic edge vector dijk. Then you are good for any uh, periodic structure of the materials. So, so now let me talk about how would you actually in introduce right this equivalent ladder school. Uh, similar, uh, but to to explain this, I think it's better to kind of start to explain how do we introduce this equivalent score for coordinates in a gym lab because you can get inspirations from that. So in the, in the equivalent score for the coordinates, so you can actually think about, uh, so they're actually taking this form uh, where this dij are the edge vector for all the neighbors of atom i. So basically, and then this uh, phi is a learnable uh, scalar number uh, that was kind of a dependent on the edge embeddings for of, a, of a node ij. So basically what you can think about is as kind of a, a weighted sum of all these edge vectors so that you can output another vector, which you can have a learnable, like a, like a, a learnable directions and, uh, and magnitude. Uh, and uh, this will also be equivalent with respect to your inputs. But actually another way to think about the same equation is that you can actually think about this term as some kind of a force that is centered around each, each edge vector. So therefore, if you basically take, you assume kind of a artificial energy, you take the derivative of each uh, coordinate and you do this kind of a factorization, then you will basically get the, and assuming this first term is a learnable parameter, then you will basically get in this equation that is exactly, almost exactly the same as this equation, but kind of explain this from a more physical perspective. But uh, the advantage of thinking about in this perspective is that then you can actually extend this also to the lattice, right? So you can take a, a derivative with respect to the L, which gives you this equation, very similar to the previous one, but plus this additional term of, uh, uh, that is related to fractional coordinates. So this is a kind of a, this will give it, basically give you an equivalent score uh, with respect to uh, the lattice. Uh, but actually one additional thing we noticed is that basically if you add an additional L here, then this will become in D and J, D, I, J, K transpose. And then this entire thing becomes symmetric. Then what you end up getting is an equivalent and both symmetric and equivalent score uh, because the, you remember of diffusion process is also symmetric, right? So then this is the kind of our eventual form of the letter score that uh, we are getting. So, uh, so now I have like talked about uh, both the forward process and the, the, the reverse process. So basically uh, in the training time, we take data and corrupt it and then in the, in the generation, and then we train this uh, equivalent model to generate the materials. And this is uh, the overall picture about the, our managing architecture. So, okay, so I'm getting to the end of this section. So I'm going to, because of the time, I'm probably only going to take uh, uh, one questions uh, one question. So I, I wonder maybe if somebody wants to shout out, uh, raise your hand for one question, we can take it now. Otherwise, I'm going to like uh, move over to the next. Okay. Uh, Ted, I'm seeing your hands up. Uh, maybe I'm only taking one question because of the time. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, my question is, is it also, and this may not be the best time to ask it, but is this, is it possible in this model to also account for the uh, the production difficulty or, the, or a path to generating the the correct material, um, and I I'm not sure this is the right time to ask that question, but I wanted to suggest it. Um, sorry, I, with, oh, sorry. Are you are you mostly talking about the uh, synthesizability of the material? 
Yes. So is there is there a stable path to fabricate the material or synthesize it? Yes. As well as it being stable once it's produced. Yes, uh, I think that, okay, I'm going to talk also a bit more later, but uh, maybe a quick answer is that right now, uh, we basically, we, we use the model to generate materials, and then we have additional things that ability prediction workflows to kind of a further filter down the candidates so that uh, before this will, will be sent out for experiments. So that's how we tackle it for now. Yeah. Uh, okay. So so there's a, like a quick question that in the chat, maybe I'm gonna answer here. Is the number of atoms fixed during the noising or denoising process? The answer is yes. Uh, okay, I'm seeing a lot of other questions, maybe five questions, which I'm not answering. We'll, we'll, we'll do those at the end, yes. <laughs> okay, perfect, thank you very much. Okay, let me move on uh, to talk about the next session, uh, which is basically how you train this model in generating novel stable materials. Uh, okay, so just to remind you, right? So currently, our learning objective is generating all metastable materials uh, in the periodic table. So we hope to curate a training data set right, that is as big as possible, but also incorporating these metastable materials. So what we did is that we combined three data sets. One is a materials project. The other one is ICST, the, the experimental data set, which is proprietary. And finally, we incorporate uh, this open Alexandria data set, uh, which was one of the biggest uh, explorations of novel materials that includes uh, around a uh, couple of million materials. And then we kind of combine all these three data sets. And uh, because they all have been run in materials project, but we rerun the calculation. And then we build a convex hull and uh, then to kind of filter the candidates so that we're only taking materials that is within 0.1 EV per atom within a combined compass hull. And we also limit ourselves into 20 atoms because this is where we have the most data and also model performs the best. And then this end up having a, a 607,000 training data points, which is uh, uh, 15 times bigger than the, than the previous uh, data set we have, which is the MP20 data set, including all the structures of the images project within 20 atoms. And basically by training our model with this big data sets, then we were able to generate in pretty realistic uh, materials across, across periodic tables. So in here, these were just uh, four randomly se selected materials uh, from the model generated. You can see there are some uh, typical alloys, and also the, the, the some uh, ionic uh, materials, uh, the, the, the three ones, each one of them have reasonable coordination environments, uh, as you can see here. But of course, you wanted to have a more quantitative uh, evaluation, so, uh, which is usually a hard question for a generative model. So we spend a lot of time thinking about what is the correct metric for you to evaluate in a generative model. So, Basically, in here, uh, we're going to look at the three key metrics. First is the percentage of stable materials within 0.1 EV per atom. And then the second is the percentage of uh, uh, unique materials, because you hope that generating diverse materials, you don't want to generate in a lot of duplicates. And last one is percentage of novel materials, because you don't want to gen regenerate in structures that was in the training data. So then we combine all of them together. And uh, so therefore, our key metric is the percentage of uh, stable, uh, unique, and a normal structure uh, abbreviated as some uh, materials, uh, which is an interesting name that would come up with. So, and then we, with this metric, we show that metagen is actually state of art in generation quality uh, compared with the previous state of art, CDVAE. So, in here, uh, actually, what you can, we actually disentangled the improvements uh, for model and data. So uh, for, for model both trained on MP20, so metagen was 1.5 times better than CDBAE, while uh, the other 1.8 uh, per performance improvement coming from uh, uh, the, the, the much bigger uh, training data. So in addition, we're also looking at uh, the uh, IMSD of structures uh, that we generated compared with the DFT relaxed structure. Uh, so in here, you can see the number with a unit of angstrom. 
So you can see again with model improvements, we see a uh, two two times a uh, three times drop. Where with data improvements, we see like a five point six times drop. So at the end, we uh, so our RMSD is very small uh, for for the generated materials uh, with respect to DFT realized structures. So in addition, uh, we also hope to looking at how does our model perform if you scale up the generation to a million uh, structures. So we actually found that, for example, uh, the, the, the uniqueness uh, only drops to uh, 80, 86% after we scale into a million crystals, meaning for these a million crystals, 86% uh, of them, they are, they are all different. And in addition, the so novelty stays the same at around uh, six, uh, uh, 68%, meaning uh, the majority of the structure generated are, are novel. So these are the overall results for the condition uh, for generating novel and stable materials with our model. So now maybe uh, I saw really lots of questions from the chat. So uh, uh, Yonish, can, can you maybe take one question for me? I'm, I'm gonna answer it here that maybe uh, answer the rest in the later. Yeah, we do have nine questions in the Q&A chain. Um, there are some that are very long. I'll, I'll reserve those to the end, but uh, we can pick one short one. Uh, so there's one from Dana O'Connor who asks, do these diffusion models work for organic molecular crystals? Uh, I, I think nobody has tried it. So for, for like a non-crystal, basically just the, uh, uh, a, a molecule in a vacuum, there's a lot of uh, work applying diffusion models for generating molecular conformers for drug discovery. And uh, for example, also the condition of protein pocket generating uh, a, a drug st molecule structure that binds into the protein. But uh, so far I have not seen any work that apply this model to uh, organic crystals, periodic crystals. But I think it will not be difficult to extend this model to those 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 class of materials. Yes. Okay. Actually, there are two more questions that are very closely related. Also, maybe somewhat short. Maybe we can tackle those right now. Uh, Sabari asks: Are the individual losses for each score tied together? And if so, how are these coupled? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So they they are tied together because I said that we. We just train a single model, right? That outputs this, all these three scores. So therefore, uh, they are all coupled together. But uh, uh, we actually need to kind of uh, tune the weights, right, for different losses, so that making sure they're all reasonable. But uh, we kind of uh, tune that based on the metric, which was stable, stable, noble, unique materials that we have. Yes, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, how about we we do the last part now and? Yeah. Okay. Know. Uh, let's move on. Okay, great. Thanks Thank for all the great questions. So now let me move on to the conditional generation of materials. Uh, so 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 far, right? I've been mostly talking about unconditional generation, meaning we just generating normal stable materials. But uh, I think the, the most important problem for material generation is really conditional generation, right? You wanted to generate some new battery material, right? You don't want to generate some random materials. So therefore, the key question is how would you like uh, use the model to generate materials condition on the properties that you are interested in. So we actually use this approach called the classifier free guidance, which is uh, basically the same approach that was used for popular text image models like DALI-2 or stable diffusion. So the key equation here is very simple, which is basically uh, you kind of uh, you sum up with these uh, two scores, unconditional score and a conditional score, and here this gamma it's just the scalar kind of weighting the contributions from these two scores. And so we already have the unconditional score, but to learn this conditional score, what you would do is that you basically taking data, basically stable materials with the condition, right? Could it be a property or could it be certain chemistry? And then you, you basically train the conditional score model using this data. But actually there is some unique challenges to train a conditional model for materials compared with training text image models uh, for DALI-2. So uh, the, let, there are two key points here. The first is that for materials, right, different conditions 
actually stays in different spaces. For example, for different materials properties, they live in, in, in different spaces, right? For chemistry, they live in a different space compared with properties. So this is quite different from text image models where the all the text just lives in the same embedding space for the text. So in addition, uh, the conditional data are really sparse, right? Because uh, it's much more expensive to generate in property data compared with uh, relaxing the material structures. So, so you usually have much fewer uh, property data compared with uh, 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 structured data. So, so this is why we adopt the fine tuning as the main approach for us to obtain a, a, a condition model uh, from the unconditional model. So basically we fine tune the unconditional model for each condition that we're interested in. So basically we have a, this shared base model, which is the unconditional model. And then we actually kind of a fine tune it for a different condition where for each condition, we have this additional MLP that uh, basically introduces an embedding layer for each one of these different conditions. So basically this component is shared for all the models and this MLP is only for each condition. And here we use this control net, which is basically a so-called parameter efficient fine tuning approach, where basically you initializing the weights and the bias for this MLP as zero. So therefore at the beginning, it doesn't alter the output, but as you fine tune, it will kind of change the output of this model based on each condition. And that's how we uh, obtain a conditional model from unconditional models. So with this approach, we actually fine tuned the unconditional model for three different kinds of conditions. One is chemistry, second is symmetry, and the last one is properties. So in, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the chemistry and the property component, and you can read more about the symmetry component in our paper. So first, let's talk about generating materials condition on chemistry. So in here, we are going to tackle the problem that we have mentioned earlier, which is uh, I give you a new chemical system uh, in any dimension, right? Uh, binary, ternary, quaternary. And the goal is to generate this lowest energy structure that was on the, on the common cell. This is a very important problem because uh, you wanted to kind of discover new materials in targeted chemical systems for a lot of materials design problems. Uh, to, to evaluate the performance of the model, we randomly selected uh, uh, nine ternary, nine quaternary, and nine quinary chemical systems with varying degrees of exploration, varying number of existing materials that you discover. And then we benchmark our model, Metagen, compared with two very popular ways of doing this type of material discovery. One is a random structure search, and the second is substitution. Uh, so basically, we use all these three methods to generate in different number of initial candidates. And then we apply a machine learning force field to relax them and filter them for the lowest energy structure. So for the top 100 structure, we put that into the DFT to see which ones are actually the most stable. So this is our, our results. Uh, basically, uh, you can see different colors represents different methods. But our key result is that here, if you're looking at the structures that is stable, normal, unique here, stable means below 0 0.1 EV per atom. So our model actually outperforms both random structure search and the substitution for both uh, ternary, quaternary, and the quinary chemical systems. So however, if you're looking at uh, the, the structures, the number of structures that was on the final combined count as how, then basically substitution still performs better, uh, slightly better than our model for the ternary and the quaternary systems. But our model have a key advantage in quinary, five element system, which actually makes a lot of sense because uh, now you're looking at a much bigger space, right? You want to generate a better candidates. Uh, and this is where the advantage of a generative models uh, comes in. So uh, this is one example of one chemical systems uh, that uh, we show the final combined commas. How here, uh, each color represents the materials. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, where does the materials coming from? What the methodology was used to discover this material? And you can see uh, many, I think maybe half of them are coming from our model. And these are some of the structures of this the materials that we generate. 
which all looks quite reasonable from a material science perspective. Uh, so, okay, so now let me move on to the second uh, conditional generation, which is to generate materials conditioned on the target properties uh, that you're interested in. So in here, this is actually one of the most important tasks here because we want to directly generate materials given required target property conditions that you are interested in. So the eventual goal is basically to replace this traditional screening-based paradigm by directly generating these final candidates. Uh, condition on the properties that you are interested in. So uh, I think one key result that we get is that we show that manager you can gen you can actually generating uh, materials condition on a diverse range of property conditions, uh, including magnetic density, uh, band gap, and bulk modulus, including magnetic and electronic and magnetic properties. So in here we fine tuning model with different number of training data as you can see listed here, but for all these three properties, uh, you can see that we can bias the generated the property of generated distribution very far away uh, from the or, original uh, original training data. So in here, the, the purple is our generated distribution and the, 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 the green are the, uh, that the training data. So I think, uh, uh, especially, for example, for magnetic density and for bulk modules, you can we can really kind of go into the maybe top ten or uh, sorry top one or even top zero one point one percentile in the data distribution. So this really shows the advantage of genetic model being able to explore this real property, real property space, but space of real property that was really hard to discover with uh, uh, screening based methods. So I'm showing you a few structures that was generated for each one of these properties. Uh, they are top candidates from our model. So uh, you can see they all look uh, also quite reasonable in terms of structures and they all have very good properties according to our DFT workflows. Uh, so finally, I'm going to show one example where we really demonstrating that we outperform screening-based methods. So in here, we are comparing with a screening-based line and you can see that there was an increased amount of DFT budget, right? So our genetic model kind of keeps discovering uh, novel materials with bulk modulus bigger than 400 gigapascal, uh, while the screening baseline kind of uh, stopped and gradually saturates because you are kind of uh, gradually exhausting the number of uh, uh, candidates that you have uh, in, in your space. Uh, so yeah, that's the kind of the end of the conditional generation part. I'm going to kind of go into directly to the end because it's almost at the end of the talk now. So in the final example, we apply our model into a more realistic materials design problem uh, that involves multiple property conditions. So in here, the problem we're trying to tackle is to design a low supply chain risk magnet because as many of you know that uh, the current uh, uh, permanent uh, magnetic materials, they, are, they all require real earth element, which poses a potential supply chain risk because uh, uh, the supply chain of these elements are pretty concentrated on some countries. So therefore, uh, so the objective here is to optimize in two properties. We hope to increase the magnetic density and we hope to decrease this so-called HHI score which is a, a kind of a score for the supply chain risk for the weighted sum of the supply chain risk of all the elements that is involved in your material. Uh, so uh, we optimize uh, the, the generative material according to these two constraints. And we have found that by optimizing uh, these two properties, we can actually bias the generative distribution towards this lower end of the HHI score. And if you actually uh, plot the distribution of elements, you can see that we're actually getting rid of these two elements uh, with a higher supply chain risk compared with other elements. And we are kind of generating a lot of uh, uh, materials that's mostly composed of iron because it's one of the lowest supply chain risk uh, elements. And this is one of the, our initial demonstration of the model in a more like realistic materials design problem. Obviously, this is a pretty early stage. It's, it's, there's a, 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 a still a gap between synthesizing the materials yet. OK, so that's kind of the end of the talk. I'm going to do a quick summary and with some outlook. So in this talk, I, I give you an overview about the metagen, 
uh, which, uh, which is the first step towards a universal generative model for inorganic materials. I have uh, discussed how do we build up this diffusion process for materials. So we have shown that, uh, so Metagen is currently the state of art generator for inorganic materials. We have shown that you can, how you can fine tune this model towards a diverse set of different constraints. And finally, we show one example of a multi-constraint optimization of finding this low supply chain risk uh, uh, magnet uh, materials. Uh, so I think uh, I think we are I think uh, I think it's pretty clear to, at least maybe to me that uh, we are gradually seeing this paradigm shift from screening based material discovery to generation based material discovery. This has already happened for uh, for jet design, right? So currently, generative model has been kind of used very widely for jet discovery in pharma companies. Uh, so I, I kind of predict this will also happen for materials, maybe in the next one or two years. And so we think this really opens up a opportunity for the community to discover potentially some breakthrough materials that was not discoverable with conventional methods. Because if you think about the material discovery, a lot of the time, we're looking for these materials with really rare properties, maybe even properties that are approaching the limit that is constrained by physics. For example, we hope to find a room temperature superconductor, right? We hope to find this super ionic conductor for the bad ways. So sometimes we don't even know uh, if the room temperature superconductor exists because they might be above what is possible according to the physics. So you're really exploring this boundary here, right? So with traditional screening based methods, even with this like a novel material discovery efforts, right? So you're really kind of expanding this Pareto front unconditionally because your generation is not guided by the property that you're interested in. So what a generative model enables is really enable you to guide your generation of materials with those properties that you're interested in. So this might open up an opportunity for us to discover uh, many breakthrough materials, right? For a broader range of properties with this generative model. So we, I hope that this, uh, I hope that we can gradually see these examples in the next one or two years. And I'm super excited to potentially talking with you if you have one of those examples that you're, you're enthusiastic about. So uh, thank you very much for your listening. I saw lots of questions in, in the chat. So I'm going to hand this over to uh, Yanesh so that we can answer uh, hopefully as many of the questions today. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, Tian. That was a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, very impressive results, I have to say. I, to be totally frank, I used to be a bit of a skeptic on generative models for, especially for periodic crystals, but I would say MatterGen has has changed my thinking on this, especially the the um, conditional generation based on um, conditional properties. That was that was a very impressive result. Uh, so yeah, we have three minutes left uh, in the hour, but uh, I, I understand that you're free at least a little bit after this, so we can go a bit over time with the questions. Um, of course, everyone in the audience feel free to drop off, but uh, if you're as curious as, as I am, perhaps you'll stick around. Um, yeah, so we have a total of 24 questions, and let's just um, start with, with a few here at random, I guess. Uh, a question from Temujin. Can this diffusion model be used to generate disordered or amorphous structures? Yeah, this is a wonderful question. Not not today, but uh, we are yeah we are we are really actively thinking about that because uh, uh, as you, many of you know, all the discussions around the disordered materials uh, coming from the A lab discussions. Yeah, we not today, but uh, we are thinking about that. Yeah. Nice, nice. Okay. Uh, another question from Ji Chi, is MatterGen ready to generate novel materials at scale of 10 to the 12, as shown in the introduction slides? I see the novelty level is 86% for 1 million materials. If it's not, what could be improved? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually thinking about uh, drawing some kind of a scaling curve to kind of extrapolate it to see how far does that go. But, uh, uh, actually, it's quite expensive to generate a million. <laughs> so we're currently looking at generating 10 million. We're going to see how does that go. But uh, I think uh, towards your question, right, what needs to be improved? I think right now, I'm not super satisfied with the novelty, which was around 70%. 
uh, I hope to making the model a bit, generating more noble materials, but uh, this is something we are kind of thinking about. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, uh, there may be some algorithm things, aspects you can improve, for example, in introducing some kind of entropy terms in the generation process. But uh, I mean, yeah, th this is the uh, one thing that I'm not super satisfied. Yeah. That's an interesting answer. We have a question sort of in a similar vein, I guess that follows on nicely to what you just said from, uh, let me see here, Gordon Peterson. What do you see as the limit for the AI inverse design of materials? What roadblocks need to be overcome for AI modeling to rival the property prediction power of DFT? Good question. So the way I think about this too is that they're actually complementary, right? So that, uh, so we actually train the model using the computation, you, property prediction power from, from DFT or the machine learning force fields, right? We use this to train our model. So I really see these two as uh, complementary components for, 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 for AI-based uh, uh, materials design. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's kind of a, so I see these two complementary. So yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah. I think so. I would, I would definitely agree with that. There are definitely, I think there can be multiple pillars or multiple workhorses in computational materials. D DFT is definitely one of them, but... Yeah, uh, let me just add a few points here, which is that I feel that, uh, so basically thinking about a screening funnel, right? So uh, so basically uh, the, this ML force field, they are kind of making it faster, right? But they're kind of a generative model kind of expands this initial space. That, that's kind of a, maybe one way to think about it. Yep. Yeah, that's a good comment. Um, oh yeah, here, a very relevant question from Anonymous. Is there a code repository we can access uh, to try and use MatterGen? Uh, yeah, so we are kind of still explore, explore options in open sourcing the code because right now the code is uh, pretty deep inside the Microsoft. So yeah, but also there's some process uh, for within Microsoft uh, for making that happen. So yeah, we're still exploring this right now. But not in uh, definitely not within one or two months. Yeah, uh, we're talking about longer term. Yeah, understandable. Yeah. Um. Let's see. What else do we have? There's a question from Hasnaina. I hope I said that right. Uh, does the corruption process or diffusion process have any limitation in supercell size or the number of atoms of the target chemical system? I think you mentioned during your talk that it works best for for structures with twenty atoms or less. But yeah. maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, uh, yeah. So basically, if you if you use the method model to kind of generating bigger crystals beyond twenty atoms, uh, the major problem we see is that it kind of generates less symmetric structures. So you most of the structure we generate for like bigger, like a, a, a kind of a basically less symmetric than what it should be compared with the training data. So that's a problem that we hope to tackle. Yep. But uh, twenty atoms still. You cover, I think you cover maybe 70% of all the material space. So that's the rough number. Yep. All right. Let's see. Uh, more questions about the code availability. We also have, ah, here's another interesting question. Um, does the model take into account valence and isotopic changes? Uh, so when you say valence, uh, I mean, I guess what you mean is charge, right? Right now it does not consider that. Sorry, what is isomorph? What is that? Isotopic changes. So I think he means, uh, or they I mean if the structure is charge balanced. Yeah, I think. Yeah. No, I think short answer is no. Yeah. And does that is that if um an infrequent source of of instability? Like you would think that if it's not charge balanced, it's it's definitely not going to be stable. Uh, actually, we we compute uh, the charge percentage of it, uh, like uh, charge neutral. I think uh, so because uh, there's no perfect uh, calculator for charge uh, neutrality. So we use SMART. Uh, I'm not sure how many are familiar with that, but uh, it, you can compute that uh, charge neutrality was maybe ninety percent for the structures in materials project. Uh, we get like maybe eighty eight percent. So it's not a big problem for our model, but it's slightly worse than materials project. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, here's another question that was sort of already answered. Are there types of structures in the training data that the current matter gen consistently does poorly when generating? So you, you mentioned large crystals are, are an issue. 
Anything yeah. else you would want to call out? Uh, nothing in particular. I think, uh, yeah, for within 20 items, I think we're doing pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. <laughs> Feels like the, the questions are coming in faster than we can answer them because we're still at 24 and we went through like six now. <laughs> uh, what's, what else do we have here? Ah, another question. Uh, maybe not that one. Um, another question from Dana O'Connor. I think we had a question already. Um, what ML force field are you using? Are you using it out of the box or with additional training? Uh, we're using MCGNet, uh, but uh, we, we have like our internal trainer MCGNet with a little bit more data. That's what we're kind of using, yeah. Mm -hmm. But op standard architecture, just additional training data? Yeah, just MCGNet. Nice, nice. <laughs> okay, let's see. We have some longer questions as well. Um, there's one from Temujin again. Would reverse process become better if trained on actual MD generated disordered or amorphous structures with its crystalline counterpart? Mm, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So I think uh, you can think about this corruption process as uh, non physical at all. So therefore, it's not very beneficial to bring more physics into it. And actually, this corruption process, uh, which I did not definitely not go into details today, but uh, uh, there's a lot of like uh, mathematical derivation that you need to get into in order to get it right. For example, it needs to have a stationary fixed limiting distribution so that you need to kind of be able to sample from. So therefore, there's kind of a lot of kind of mathematics to getting this corruption process correct. And there's basically tons and tons of ML papers around that. So uh, it is, uh, so, so a short answer is that uh, this corruption process is just, is artificial. Uh, it and uh, it, you cannot change. You, it's not easy to kind of. Uh, uh, it, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to bring physics into it. That's maybe a, a short answer to the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question comes from Gabrielle, who asks, "Would you have any perspective for integrating these generative models into active learning schemes, where you could run the structure predicted by the model into automatic ab initio workflows to validate your properties and be able to feed them back to the model as further training data?" Yeah, we're actually actively thinking about that, right? So, for example, if you wanted to see maximizing block modulus, right, you're generating a bunch of new materials, then you run DFT calculation on them for those ones that actually high bucket modules kind of feed back into your training data and kind of iteratively do that multiple steps. So we're thinking about that, but uh, we have not done that yet, yes. Okay, here's one question from Madi, which maybe you could, you, we could somewhat refer to the paper, but maybe you can give us a, a rough outline here in the, in the presentation. How do you pre precisely define a structure as being novel with respect to the reference data? What is considered novel, just new stoichiometry or new prototype? If new prototype, how do you define what is a prototype? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, we, we just use the structure matcher uh, within PyMagin. So basically, two structure needs uh, are, 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 the, are the same. Uh, 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 basically, if all the atom coordinates match and atom type match, that's how we define it. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's see. Another question from Alex who asks, have any experimental validation been performed for the final generated candidates? And is there any possibility to add synthesizability condition to drop DFT stable but non-synthesizable candidates? Mm, yeah, good question. So we're, we're currently uh, exploring uh, options to experimentally validate those candidates right now. Uh, and uh, yes, so currently there are two different ways, right? So one is basically making your training data more synthesizable. The second way is that you do this as a post hoc kind of a filtering step with some uh, additional synthesizability calculators like phonon spectrum, et cetera. So we're currently doing the second, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, I guess we already covered this somewhat. So Raz asks, could you please expand a bit on the synthesizability slash feasibility workflows mentioned earlier? 
Uh, yes. Yeah, so basically, yeah, there are a couple of them, right? One is, uh, uh, bas yeah, one, one important thing is definitely phone lungs. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the second thing is basically, yeah, you can run a bit of like uh, MD and that you, if the, for example, the structure kind of uh, uh, corrupts into a different structure, then it will not be, it will, it means it's not stable, right? At that temperature. And there's uh, quite a few other things like, uh, for example, uh, amorphous limit, that was uh, a, a, a concept that was introduced uh, by uh, Matthias project, uh, right? So that was also a very important thing. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are many, many other things. It's, it's active research area, so yeah. All right, yeah, amorphous limit, that's a, a good paper. Yes. Uh, 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 yeah, Jasmine or, or Yasmin asks, do you plan on incorporating defects to your generated structures? That sounds hard. Yes, yeah, that's hard. Not yet, but uh, yeah, we're thinking about that. Yeah. Thinking about that. Okay. Is that higher or, or lower on the priority list compared to amorphous? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that right now I feel maybe one of the most important thing is uh, like a disordered, uh, right? Now stock damage material because all the discussions around it. Yeah, but I think all these are important. So we just need to kind of prioritize. We need to, we have a limited amount of efforts, obviously. Yeah. Very true. Very true. Um, let's see. Let's scroll further down. I feel like I haven't taken a look at the newest questions yet. Um, can you? Here is a question from Zaren. Can you please explain a little bit more about matter gen generalizing to properties that are far away from the training property distribution? How does that happen? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I think uh, uh, so. As long as you have one or two examples, right? So then I think the model were able to generalize. We are also a little bit surprised to see like how good the model performs in that way. But uh, I think it looks like it looks at uh, the structure and the chemistry of the existing materials that was in, for example, see high bulk modules regimes and then generating a lot of structures that are quite similar to that. So that's kind of a uh, uh, and also, for example, you combine different elements, right? So you see one element that is so hard, you see another element that is hard, you can combine them together. So there's a lot of those patterns that we see from our models. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That gives you a bit of intuition. Yeah. Do, do you have some, just a follow up question from me here, do you have some intuition about why the distribution of the generated band gaps was much wider than for the, the magnetic moment and the bulk modulus? I mean, yeah, it's a more non-local property, I guess you could argue. <laughs> yeah, that's a wonderful question. So generally speaking, right, if you do property predictors, the band gap is also one of the hardest things that you you you, you predict. And I think uh, my intuition for this is uh, definitely that uh, basically there's kind of a band gap is more like a, some kind of Fourier space property, right? So it's kind of uh, the distance to the real space. Uh, it's, it's a bit further compared with other properties. That's at least the, my intuition to this. But uh, Seems that the band gap is always a harder, harder property, no matter it's a generative model or a, a, like a property predictor. Yeah, very much agree. That's that's true. We have a question from Adorne. By the way, stop me if you're running out of time. Uh, let me know. But because, I have uh, more time. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, good. We answered like 18 questions now, but there's still more than when we started. <laughs> sure. so I'm, not, I'm not sure we're going to get to the end. Um, so Adorna asks, can the model take temperature or pressure into account when generating materials? Are these stable in ambient conditions or zero Kelvin? Thank you. Uh, yeah, right now it's just zero Kelvin. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. That's a, that's a fast answer. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, we have a question from Peichen who asks, in the reference um, long list of names, uh, the, the Grossman paper, examining graph neural networks for crystal structures, the author discussed that GNN generally has poor performance in predicting the periodicity of crystals. I was wondering why MatterGen chose to use the edge to predict the lattice score. How trustworthy is such a process? Yeah, that's a, that's actually a good question. I was also involved in this paper as well. So where we find that, for example, it's pretty hard to predict the lattice length, but for structures. So one into I think we we got to like we need a bit of an uh, iterations for this part. And uh, so basically, I think one thing is that you we introduce kind of a lot of a rescaling, right? So in intuitively, 
if you kind of know the edges, right? So on each direction, you kind of know the periodicity. So we kind of use that intuition to guide the model. So I think it gives reasonably good performance for the latter score, but uh, I think it can still be improved uh, in the future. I'm looking forward to potential kind of architecture improvements in that space. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that seems like a, a deep question. Okay, here's, uh, not sure I understand the question fully, but Eduardo asks, is there any way of conditioning the reconstruction part of the diffusion on the known chemistry trends of the atoms, such as bond tendencies, likely coordinations, etc.? cetera? Uh, I don't, also don't fully understand the question. Uh... Uh, yeah, but uh, maybe maybe to give an answer, I think uh, uh, you can condition anything as long as you have a forward function that I give you a structure that outputs something, right? So you can, we can any we can condition anything that was in that form. But uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think the the short answer, Eduardo, is is yes, I would guess. But <laughs> um. Oh, a very similar follow-up question from Nicholas. Can any arbitrary property, maybe something like manufacturability, that can be expressed in terms of the score model be used for conditional generation? Mm, yes. Yeah, so for example, you, if you have a, like a, a manufacturability scoring function, function, right? So I give you a list of uh, materials and you compute each one of their manufacturing scores, right? that it will be looking very similar to, for example, condition on band gaps or condition on bulk modulus. And then you can do it in that way. So yeah, in principle, anything that uh, is, you can compute, you can condition on. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a follow-up question about the structure matcher from Anonymous. Um, do you use ignore species to attempt to check whether the frameworks are similar? Uh, good question. Not, not, no, not yet because it's super, super expensive. Uh, we are really we are tracking like uh, compared with a very big set, right? So mm -hmm. like uh, we're talking about uh, close to a million materials. But uh, so if you do this for like uh, if you ignore the item types, it will be super, super expensive. No, we yeah. do not do that yet. <laughs> and even so, I would say structure matter isn't cheap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, so we, we still have over 20 questions left, but um, maybe we can do a couple more. Yes, I think I'll let you control the time. I think also, yeah, also don't want to maybe too long. Yeah, but uh, I'll let you control the time. Okay. <clears throat> um... So there's one from Nikolai who asks, do you have any ideas for diffusion on the number of atoms such that one can sample the grand canonical ensemble? Uh, yeah, good question. So there's some work that was in the, like, uh, uh, in, in the machine learning community called jump diffusion. You can, you can search for that, that also do number of atom uh, diffusion, uh, but uh, it's not grand canonical ensemble. So I think, uh, more innovation would be needed to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go, Nikolai. That's that's uh, your your door into this field. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I think we already answered this. There's a question: Is your team working on any model for organic materials design, or we we answered something like that? Uh, no. <sighs> okay, there we go. Um, no, but we also have drug effort, drug discovery effort at AI for Science. All right. Um, what else is here? Christian asks, why choose a Gaussian function for diffusion model? What are the benefits compared to others such as linear, polynomial, or Ipanichnikov? Yeah. Never heard of that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Gaussian was basically the simplest form because if you kind of convolve to Gaussians, it's still a Gaussian. So that kind of makes the mathematics of the diffusion process much easier. So it's actually not trivial to extend this into non-Gaussian functions, uh, but there's uh, some work that was doing in that space. Yeah, but uh, short answer is Gaussian is simple. Mm -hmm. some, some prior work or some work internally going on at the moment? Uh, some, some external 
work more like on diffusion. This is like a more general diffusion model question, right? So it's not a specific to materials. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Here's one from Tai Wu who asks, when you corrupt the lattice, have you considered the conservation of the atom number? In other words, you should know the stoichiometry of the material before the process, right? Oh yeah, I guess it's... Uh, yeah, but we also corrupt atom types, so therefore stoichiometry can change, but the number of atoms don't change. Yeah. All right. So we're, we're reaching 20 minutes past the hour here. Um, and we went through almost 30 questions. <laughs> so this is this was a very heroic effort. Thank you very much, Tian. And um, much for moderating. Yeah. I, I apologize to everyone whose question we didn't get to. I realize there are a lot of questions left. Um, we will, like I said, upload this video to our the MP YouTube channel probably by tomorrow. And so feel free to uh, continue the discussion there, uh, especially if those maybe can be answered by other people in the audience. Um, let me let me finish by extending a very very big thank you again, Tian, for coming on and and for presenting MatterGen to this audience. I think this was a, a clear sign of of huge interest in the field, and uh, we're very excited to see what what you'll be doing next. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Janusz, like uh, for like uh, moderating this, and also great opportunity to be here to like. Uh, I think I always think the materials projects. Summit is very, very prestigious. So I'm very glad to be able to present here. Thank you.